You better believe there is such a thing as ex-gay. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, Let me tell you one of the biggest things that makes us different than just talk radio or news talk radio or conservative talk radio. We point to the gospel. We point to the gospel. We point to Jesus. We say there is a better way. We say, yeah, the world is messed up. America is messed up. But there is a better way. There is hope. Whatever struggles you have, whatever problems America has. There is hope in the gospel. This is Michael Brown. Welcome to the broadcast today. We want to point you in the way of hope. Relational, sexual brokenness can be healed. There can be deliverance. There can be repentance. There can be freedom. There can be new life. If you have a question for my guest that I'm about to introduce to you, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. Gary and Melissa Ingram, uh, lead Love and Truth Network. They started in 2013 after more than 12 years of ministering to individuals and communities dealing with relational and sexual struggles. They were married in 2007, September 2007, and have two sons. We want to be practical. We want to be hopeful today on the broadcast. Yes, the world around us is messed up. Bigger yes, there is a solution to every problem in the gospel. Gary and Melissa, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much, Michael. Great to be with you. You there, Melissa? Yeah. How you doing, Dr. Brown? Doing very, very well. Hey, first tell us about Love and Truth Network, and then I want to hear your own stories. And I've got a bunch of specific questions for you. But Gary, give me an overview of Love and Truth Network. Sure. So we started Love and Truth Network uh, after I was on staff at a church for about 12 years as a, in a pastoral role, and recognizing that as great as the church is in so many areas, the church does not do a very good job in dealing with sexual brokenness across the board, whether it's heterosexual pornography, um, adultery, fornication, or certainly in the area of um, LGBT struggles. And so uh, we formed Love and Truth Network, as you said, back in 2013. And then more recently, uh, a year ago, I was asked to uh, be the director of another organization called Transforming Congregations, which is essentially identical to Love and Truth Network, but is focused within the United Methodist uh, Church. Got it. And and Melissa, your own background, you're a national certified counselor and licensed in New York State as a mental health counselor. How does that play in with the larger calling of Love and Truth Network? Well, it really um, ties in in a great way. Um, Our vision is really to equip Christian leaders um, to develop transformational environments for the majority of Christians dealing with some form of sexual and relational brokenness. And a lot of times there are common uh, factors that can contribute to, to that brokenness. And so having been trained as a counselor and, um, you know, specifically looking at early childhood relationships and how those can continue to affect us today, um, often we can bring that information and tie it into how God designed us developmentally to grow, um, to grow up in a family. And so, yeah, it's really been a great uh, balance of, you know, more pastoral counseling from Gary's point of view and then professional counseling from my point of view. I got a trans- Dr. Brown. We- yeah, go ahead. If I could just quickly say, so what Melissa was just sharing, I mean, we really believe that uh, one aspect of the church that's very powerful is that church can really be, the body of Christ can really be a second chance at family. And so where there's been developmental issues, where there's been deprivation or loss, neglect, rejection, abandonment, abuse, any of those things growing up, the church is really, um, a part of its role is is to... Uh, is to be able to come in and, and love and care for, and in balance of love and truth, to care for and nurture uh, people. And, and God can really uh, bring great healing, even to our past issues, through uh, the, a church that's ministering effectively. Right, and that's, that's what we should be doing, friends. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, and he came to call sinners to repentance. That's who we are.
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. It's it's one thing for us to say gay activism is wrong. We don't agree with transgender activism. Uh, there's a real problem with pornography. It's 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 one thing for us to identify problems. It's another thing for us to offer gospel-based solutions to these problems. Okay, someone in our church is struggling with pornography. Someone in our church is struggling with gender identity confusion. Someone in our church is struggling with same-sex attraction. What do we do? Do we have answers? Many times, pastors and leaders struggle because these are new situations or ones they feel they can't relate to. On the one hand, same God, same gospel, same truth sets people free. On the other hand, there are people gifted, their own background, their own calling, that are specialists that can then help equip the church. I'm speaking today with Gary and Melissa Ingram. They lead Love and Truth Network, serving individuals and serving churches. If you have a question for them, we'll get to some calls, probably, 866-348-7884. So, Gary, let's just start with your own personal story and something that makes you uniquely equipped to minister to others who struggle. What's your own story in terms of dealing with unwanted same-sex attraction? Sure. Uh, Even though I grew up in a Christian home and uh, heard a lot of truth, it was a pretty rural setting and uh, pretty legalistic uh, church and home base. My parents had a lot of their own brokenness that they uh, never worked out uh, and didn't know that they there was any avenue for even doing that. And so they brought a lot of that into uh, the home, obviously, and, and, and raising uh, their children. I'm the youngest of five. And yeah, and the, Gary, let me just jump in. When, when you, talk about, you talk about brokenness among your, your mom and dad, some yeah. folks understand that immediately. Some say, what's, what's he talking about? What, what do you mean? What kind of brokenness sure. did they bring? Sure, absolutely. So my, my mom's father died when she was uh, five or six years old and unexpectedly, and uh, they were in a, kind of a welfare setting um, many, many, many years ago, and, uh, and, and just little connection with her own uh, mom and, and just felt very alone and isolated. And then my dad's mom left the family and her kids and her husband when he was about five, and he, he and his siblings were sort of farmed out to different members of the family that really didn't want them. But uh, they took them just to, uh, to help his father uh, sort of get on, you know, back on his feet again. But they were out there with different family members for probably a year or more. And then uh, he remarried, his dad remarried, and, and they had their own children. And so there was just, they both experienced a lot of um, rejection growing up, a lot of lack of, of um, affectionate love. And, and so, again, they, they found each other, and they were kind of each other's rescue um, in many respects, and they were good people, but just didn't understand really, like he didn't understand a role as a father um, as being much mm-hmm. more than providing a roof over your head and clothes on your backs and, and, and food on the table. He didn't have any understanding of emotion, the need for emotional connection, particularly with me. And, and so uh, I have three older brothers, one older sister, and my older brothers were old enough that they played with their friends and, and didn't really want me around, understandably. And my, my dad, again, formed really little uh, connection with me. So I really ma- remained bonded with my mom and my older sister. And then at school, at church, um, I was the source of a lot of bullying by other boys. And so I learned pretty quickly. What I, what I interpreted all that to mean is the only safe place for me is in the world of girls. And so throughout my developmental years, I really marinated in the feminine and, and all around me. And, uh, mm. and so for people to say that that had no impact, on um, the development of, um, I mean, God gives us a longing as boys to bond with our fathers and, and to, to, to gain nurture and strength from them. And to say that there's no impact of all that I did experience on the development of same-sex attraction would be, you know, to me, it's ridiculous. I was also exposed to pornography, hardcore porn, by some older neighborhood boys and some of their homosexual behavior at the age of five or six years old. So a lot of stuff. James set in really early. Uh, lack of connection with my dad for sure, and um, and it just it really put me on a trajectory of um, of of um, isolation, um, shame, and 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 really led down this pathway of this hunger for male love and affection that became sexualized. So when you came to this realization that you were attracted to other men, was that something that you said, okay, wonderful, I should explore this, or is that something that terrified you? Oh, it was horrible. I, when I realized it, it was it was 
yeah, it was just a terrible uh, realization. I don't remember now. I mean, it came to me early enough on that I don't remember the specifics about it, but I do remember just being chilled and and hating the fact that I felt differently um, than other boys. I, I wanted to uh, uh, to experience what you know down the road what family would look like. I wanted to be uh, to be attracted to girls like boys around me, obviously, where I think that's where it first settled in. Like, there's something different about me because I don't, I don't feel the same way um, as, as, these, as my, my guy peers in the gym class or whatever. Not that they lived it out very well. I mean, it was pretty uh, raunchy. But, uh, but I knew there was something different um, at that point, and, um, and it really separated me from my peers. Now, now, Melissa, you obviously didn't know Gary at this point, but you have counseled many people, families, individuals. How common is Gary's story in terms of the upbringing and the relationships and how things develop? Is, is his co- story common? I would say um, it's very common that usually, um, and and I also come out of a same-sex background, but also um, a lot of heterosexual brokenness. And so the, the factor of um, a, a point of disconnect between the same gender parent and same gender peers is very, very common in those that that tend to to later um, struggle with with same sex attraction. It's not in every case, um, but it's in a lot of cases. And so for me, you know, I sort of watched my parents' marriage, which was broken in the sense that they were um, very distant from one another. My father was very absent; he didn't want to be around my mother, and I just viewed her as weak and passive and a victim, and I wanted nothing to do with her. I I just made a vow that I would never be like her because I saw that she was trapped, and and I had no idea that I was basically detaching from the feminine, and that really played out in terms of just me becoming more masculine as I entered college and, and different things. So... Yeah, I mean, definitely, family uh, plays a big a big role in the development of of same sex attraction, and then also, as Gary mentioned, I think his early sexual abuse and exposure to pornography also um, is common. And at what point did you realize that you were attracted to the same sex? So that was in in college. Um, I had been engaged to a guy, and that had been my third serious relationship, um, and I was just really dissatisfied. I was empty and, and depressed, and and I was sort of in a crowd that was very open-minded, and it was just sort of suggested, you know, hey, you know, would you ever consider, and it was about a particular female friend, and um, and that just really opened a door to be like, huh. And, and so I just began a period of questioning and searching, you know, my junior year of, of college. And then uh, my senior year of college, I, I entered a lesbian relationship. And that was pretty powerful. I mean, I thought this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And that really, I think, tapped into that unmet need um, that, uh, for, for feminine love from my mother, which I didn't even realize I needed that. Um, but I, I definitely felt like I needed this woman in order to be um, a whole person. So, yeah, so for me it was was later. But I can see some of the um, – yeah, so I don't, I don't remember struggling with um, attraction to girls from an early age. Yeah. But probably in junior high, high school, I did start to feel a little different. I think I was definitely more tomboyish, more masculine than – um, some of the other girls, and, and part of that had to do with, um, you know, my older brother was uh, physically abusive and somewhat sexually abusive. And so he would make comments about my body, and I learned very quickly that it wasn't safe. And again, that goes in with watching my mom. And yeah. so I just really, I, and I don't even think I realized it at the time, I just didn't want to be feminine or female. And so yeah, I and, and friends- detached from that. Yeah, friends, as as you're listening to these two stories, you see how different they are in terms of sexual, romantic attraction, development, these things, how they happen. But but that's that is a a picture of of America. That's a picture of the world, meaning 
it's not just a little category. Well, I'm same-sex attracted. This one's gay or this one's lesbian. Different people at different times in their lives have different experiences. Different people through these experiences can now walk into things they wouldn't have walked into before. But what's common is that there's something that's going wrong somewhere along the line relationally, or there could be abuse or something else happening, and it contributes then to these desires or feeds into them or even opens the door to them. The good news is we're talking to a happily married couple, a man and woman enjoying the Lord, enjoying their relationship, raising their sons, Jesus transformed. So we come back, let's talk about how that transformation happened in each of their lives. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I'm talking today with Gary and Melissa Ingram. They lead Love and Truth Network. They both come out of backgrounds of sexual sin, sexual brokenness, same-sex relationships, and they offer counseling, hope, ministry to the church. If you have a question for our guest, We'll take some calls a little later, 866-348-7884. Gary, getting back to you, uh, did you then give yourself over to to a homosexual lifestyle in terms of relationships and this became part of your life? Yeah, I really did. I battled it for a long time. Uh, I I bounced around from public school to Christian school to homeschooling and, and went to a local Christian Bible college. And then uh, left there after about a year and a half, and I just had it with God, with the church, with Christianity. I mean, to the point that I would say I, I just grew to hate uh, the church and God, and because I felt like I'd been praying and praying and praying and seeking and seeking and seeking, and it just felt like there was nothing there. The church didn't know what to tell me. I felt like God did nothing to was doing nothing to help me, and so um, so I, I left and I I went off. I wound up becoming. Uh, uh, getting connected with a, a gay bar, becoming a bartender at a gay bar. And yeah. uh, and that felt euphoric for a while. Like Melissa said, it felt like this is what I was looking for my whole life. And I just bought into the whole, uh, this is the way I was made um, scenario, or or maybe I'm just this cosmic screw up. This is who I am. And uh, But after a couple of years, I really began to feel, in my early 20s, I began to feel at, my, at a soul level like I was an old man. I mean, I... I I went into this wanting to find Mr. Right, and it was anything but that. I had been with so many people I couldn't even name it, and that was never my desire. That's not what I wanted, uh, but that's the way it, it ended up, as is, is often the story for so many. Not everyone, but so many. So when you say so many, you're, you're in the church world, you're in the heterosexual community, you counsel lots of people. Would you say, generally speaking, that there is lack uh, a a – uh, less stability and wholeness in homosexual relations than heterosexual relations. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that uh, that drives me a little bit crazy is to to, to have been there and and uh, and know so many people that have as well. And you know, today you would think, uh, based on a lot of the communication in in, uh, in the news or popular media, that nearly every gay identified man and woman um, has been partnered and will be partnered for the same with the same person for the rest of their life. And certainly in the male population, particularly, while that does happen, it's extremely rare. And even where that does happen, oftentimes there's more often than not, anecdotally at least, I believe there's, from those that I know, there's an open relationship where they're having sex with multiple you know, people, yeah. even though they're together. So yeah, there's very little instability when it comes to, uh, by comparison to the heterosexual community. Right. And again, we know that uh, even, even from open sharing from, from the homosexual community. So Melissa, uh, when did you hit bottom in your own life? Well, it, you know, it really was the grace of God. Um, I, as I mentioned before the break, I had gotten involved in a lesbian relationship my senior year of college, and she quickly dumped me, and I had already been feeling a stirring of of really lacking something in my relationship with God. So I was a religious kid. I mean, I grew up in a religious family, and I was involved with um, 
you know, a student ministry center on campus. And so the Lord really just used that breakup to bring me to to the end of myself. I mean, I was devastated. And I don't think it was really about her. Um, It was as if the weight of all of my broken relationships came crashing down on me. And it was about a month later, um, I have an identical twin sister, um, and she had gotten saved through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And she invited me to a missions conference, and I gave my life to Christ, uh, like, at the end of December of that same year. So it was—I'm just so grateful um, that I didn't have a long period um, and that, you know, God rescued me uh, early, you know, early enough. And, uh, yeah, so it was pretty—you know, and that didn't mean, you know, I I remember praying this, you know, the sinner's prayer or whatever, and— and really what was powerful about that was confessing that I had been deceived into in believing that this was who I was, that, mm. that God had created me a lesbian. And also my idolatry, really, which was, which was making this woman the center of my life instead of God. And so that was, that was really powerful. But I also recognized that just surrendering to Jesus, while awesome, I knew that I had a lot of work to do. So I, I, I mean, I do believe the Lord gave me discernment early on that I was going to need extra help in in beginning to change my thought patterns um, about men and about women um, because I had really started looking at at everybody I met really through this lens of of you know just sexually or what what you know are they attracted to me am I attracted to them you know that kind of thing so. Um, I knew, I asked early on, you know, okay, what do I do now? Um, at the time, they didn't have a lot of good answers, but um, maybe we'll get into a little bit about what was helpful. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. Uh, but I-, I think one of the biggest things that you said is-, is something God helped you to realize right at the beginning, that you wrongly identified, that you thought that God had created you to be same-sex attracted, and that that's who you were as opposed mm-hmm. to recognizing that that's not who you were and that's not how God created you. That's, from everything I understand, half of the battle right there. Uh, Gary, we've just got about two minutes before the break, but how is it that God brought you to himself? Well, it was I was driving on an interstate and um, angry with God because he had messed up my— I knew he had uh, intervened and messed up my plans for partying for a long weekend. And so I was driving back home, and, and for some reason I popped in a Christian CD uh, uh, or tape, and, uh, and God just gave me this window of clarity and, and took my, my very, very hardened heart, calloused heart, and, and gave me this window of opportunity to actually feel. Something in the lyric just struck my heart, and I began to sob and, uh, and absolutely mm-hmm. just broke down. And even though I'd prayed the sinner's prayer you know, a bunch of times before when I was growing up, there was no surrender in it. And so finally, you know, my, my coming to Christ was really about pulling over on a New Jersey turn, uh, turnpike because uh, I couldn't see where I was going and just saying, mm-hmm. God, if you want what's left of me, you can have me. And that really was the beginning of, of, of this change. And, um, and, of course, and, and the other thing, Melissa and I always say is we still deal with some levels of same-sex attraction. And our attitude about that is, but it, it doesn't rule our lives any longer. And our attitude about that is big deal. Everybody deals with attraction and desires that are contrary to God's will, it's what do we do with those, and are we going to really surrender those to the Lordship of Christ? Yeah, exactly. And and we, we want to unpack some of these things. Gary and Melissa are able to stay on with us into the second half of this hour. We want to unpack some of these things, but take away a few things. Everybody's broken. Everybody's fallen. Everybody needs a Redeemer. Everyone has desires and attractions contrary to God's will. And everyone can choose, do I identify with those attractions or do I identify with who I am in Jesus? And in doing so, we overcome and we live godly, transformed lives that are whole and that can make others whole. To find out more about Gary and Melissa Ingram, what they do for churches, individuals, go to loveandtruth, A-N-D, loveandtruthnetwork.com. That's loveandtruthnetwork.com. It's The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. 
your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the line of fire. This is a special broadcast today where we're focusing on healing, repentance, transformation from sexual sin, sexual brokenness, relational brokenness. I'm speaking with Gary and Melissa Ingram, their ministry, Love and Truth Network. So, Gary, when you and Melissa got married, so this was back in 2007, so you've been married Mm -hmm. going on 10 years now. Yeah. Would would, (coughs) Excuse me. Would you say that you had... uh, the same kind of problems and adjustments to make as other couples getting married. Would you say because you both came out of same sex attraction that you had uh, different, uh, different issues to deal with? I mean, you, again, you counsel lots of people. What's, what's your analysis? I think that we had uh, the same issues that many people um, need to deal with, but few people actually do. And then I'd say we had some additional issues. So, uh, as Melissa indicated, you know she spent a lot less time um, uh, in in lesbianism than I did in homosexuality and in the community, uh, and so and and I'd wrestled from very, a very very early age. So uh, I, there was a lot more, I think, adjustment um, uh, for me in regard to our relationship and fears about uh, am I going to be able to to really meet Melissa's needs. Uh, one of the things we talk a lot about is um, the reality of God's image in us as male and female, and the church doesn't really talk about that uh, sufficiently by a long shot. We're not just supposed to be kind as human beings to one another. We're supposed to be living out what does it mean to be a man made in God's image and a woman made in God's image toward one another. And so I think that in many respects, we we had a lot more to deal with, I think, in some ways, as well as the, as other couples, but because we were forced to really look at our issues, and, and we we went through some pretty brutal premarital counseling because we were willing to put it all on the table and, and mm. have some pastors hash through it with us. That was essential for getting off uh, on a good start. So I think we actually had a leg up in our in our relationship because of all the work we needed to do and all of the understanding we needed to gain um, from our brokenness and what God was redeeming us from that a lot of people even bother to consider that are going into marriage. Yeah, so recognizing there could be more pitfalls, you went through, as you say, more brutal premarital counseling, but mm-hmm. that, that's a lot of wisdom involved in that. And, and Melissa, if someone says to you, well, are you guys really happily married? Are you like a normal couple raising your, your sons together? Because you, you know all the skeptics and the critics out there, and you guys are just living oh, in yeah. denial and all this. So speak to them freely. Yes. Well, honestly, when we, when we speak publicly, I know what people are really wondering is, do they have a good sex life? Like, are they even having sex? And do they actually enjoy it? And I can say wholeheartedly, yes. Um, and so, honestly, in that way, I don't think we're like a normal couple. I mean, you would be shocked. Mm. I mean, maybe not, you wouldn't be shocked, but I think a lot of Christians would be shocked at how many Christian couples are not having sex regularly and or one or both partners are not enjoying it. So, um I would say we are happily married. We have a great sex life. Um, we do have challenges like communication. We're both obviously in ministry, and so we have a hard time um, finding family time, um, finding time together. Gary travels a lot for Love and Truth Network and, and things like that. But I would say, and again, I think this goes back to what Gary um, referenced earlier in that God has made us in his image, male and female. God has done a transformational work in my um, my identity as a woman made in his image. And so me being married to Gary is about so much more than just not being married to a woman. I mean, it really is um, an outward evidence of an internal reality. Now, the other thing we often hear... Uh, t- tell you what, I've, I've got to interrupt. Well, H- oh, hold okay. that thought. Hold that thought. We've got a break. There's the other thing you wanted to share. Friends listening, I know a lot of you saying that God can really do this. Yes, he can. He does all the time. He does it all the time. We're going to give some keys to transformation when we come back. Oh, God of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. It's 
The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to the broadcast. Find out more about my guest, Gary and Melissa Ingram. Go to Love and Truth. It's spelled A N D, Love and Truth Network.com to find out more about their ministry, who they are, and what they do. So, Melissa, right before the break, you were about to get to another important point. We had to cut you off. So, back to you. Yes. Well, often um, we hear concerns that, that healing from homosexuality or gender identity confusion, um, that that means I have to get married. And we would say, no, that doesn't. And in fact, um, often people have been counseled erroneously to get married in hopes of fixing their same-sex attraction. And so we would say, no way. Um, Marriage is stressful. Um, It's a positive change, but it's still a change. Um, And so, you know, Gary and I had also done work emotionally and spiritually, even before we met each other. And, and we had participated in different, participated in different programs to, to begin um, working on our issues and, and growing in Christ and things like that. So marriage, um, whether it's heterosexual or, or whatever, um, it can be pretty messed up. And so it isn't, when I say it's an outward evidence of an inward transformation, that is certainly true for me. I wouldn't say that that marriage is the only um, or has to be the only goal for those walking in that process. Of right. So, so we don't want to make the mistake. Let's say a guy like Gary comes to faith. He's been in same sex relationships. He's been sexually active in homosexual relationships. Now he gets saved. And you think, wow, we got this gal in the church. She's 19. She's beautiful. She loves the Lord. We should kind of hook them up to cure him. You know, that those things are, are disastrous. Or to try to put pressure on you that you have to be heterosexual as opposed to God's calling you to holiness. And that's how everything's mm-hmm. going to be worked out. So rather than just fighting a desire, okay, I'm not going to think this, I'm not going to think this. There's growing in Jesus, growing in his image, growing in holiness, experiencing repentance. And then other things can be addressed where there is this brokenness that needs to be addressed or healed. But Gary, you mentioned that we don't talk enough about male, female distinctions, giftings. Uh, explain that more fully. What do we need to understand as a church about being created by God in his image, male and female? Well, somewhere along the line, I mean, well, to think about the fact that God is establishing and putting his image in us at the beginning and the foundation of creating all things. Uh, so it, so obviously the, it's of great importance. And the fact that the enemy, Satan, wanted to be like God, and, and the closest that any of us have ever uh, gotten to that is the reality that there's one species that actually contains his image. And, uh, and so the enemy, you know, I think a lot of what's going on with homosexuality and transgenderism and all the heterosexual uh, uh, stuff in, as well is it really is an identity crisis that, that, uh, that, that transcends the LGBT issue. Um, and and it, it really goes, it, it goes to the heart of this dismantling of gender in our culture, because it's within gender that we contain the image of God. And we're, and we're meant to live it out very differently. We, it's of equal value in male and female, and the church historically has not done a good job of that. There's been a lot of misogyny, a lot of devaluing of the feminine uh, and, and elevating of the masculine. And by that, then, you know, feminism kind of rose up, and, and that shot way beyond what was, in my opinion, what was healthy. And so we have this war kind of going on often between uh, male and female. And, and, and then there's also mm-hmm. this cry for sameness. So it's not even a cry for equality. It's a cry for sameness rather than a recognition that, um, that a woman's um, best place in terms of living out the image of God is to do it as God created her to do it, not as a man is supposed to do it. And so when we can come together as single individuals, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and recognize the good of the image of God in the other. And that does not happen in your typical churches. Um, and, and, and then in our marriages, recognize the good of the other, bless it, uh, call it out, cooperate with, you know, with that. Uh, and that. That is so much more transcendent, so much more powerful in developing um, deep and abiding relationships and people living into the fullness of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ than, than when we leave that piece out 
of the equation, and we're simply trying to be better human beings, if that makes sense. Yeah, oh, it definitely makes sense. And again, it's the blurring of distinctions. It's the war on yep. gender. And I want to come to that in a bit, some transgender-related issues. But Melissa, in a culture now in which we live, which not only declares war on gender, but then is saturated with pornography and mm-hmm. saturated with everything being sexualized to the point that you have you have guys that are 20 years old that can't perform – without Viagra because they're so used to pornography. You have mm-hmm. marriages falling apart because because of breakdowns in sexual relationship and a lot of it due to pornography. What are some things, if you were teaching the church about healthy sexuality, about how men and women are supposed to relate to each other? We, we know what the problem is. What are some of the healthy solutions, the biblically-based solutions that you would present to the church? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it it's important to um, first of all, we have to um, unplug <laughs> from technology, um, and 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 so it, in order to actually foster real relationships. So um, you know the the younger generation. So now we're talking millennials. You know, twenty something. Um, they are used to having everything quick and fast and at their fingertips. And so even being able to work at relating to another human being, it does not come easy. Um, a lot of them have grown up in front of the TV, in front of the computer, and so they're even lacking the most basic, um, basic skills. And then the message of the church needs to really um, shift from, just don't do it, (laughs) meaning don't have sex, and let's not talk about it anymore, just don't do it, Um, we really need to talk about how actually God created sex, and, and, and that was His design, and it is very good, and here's why we need to save it for marriage, and, and really talk about sex in, in an overall context of marriage and family and how good it is, and, and so that, that we don't um, just immediately associate shame with sex. Because even heterosexuals growing up in church, they've just been taught, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and then you get married, and all of a sudden it's okay. And they're like, oh, I can't downshift that fast. Mm-hmm. And then as you're mentioning, the, oh my God, goodness, the, the incidence of pornography, even among women now, is increasing. We're showing upwards of 30% of women are involved in pornography online. And, and that may take a different, that may look a little differently for them. It may be more chat rooms and, and story based, um, but uh, really getting them out of virtual reality and, and to, to relate to other individuals would be where I would, where I would start. And Gary, uh, anything yeah, have- you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk a lot about uh, with, with leadership teams and pastors about the, the desperate need, frankly, that the underpinning of sexual brokenness is largely relational. And uh, even for men, uh, you know, certainly for women, but even for men. And, and what we've seen is that most of us in the church are, are disconnected from one another, even within groups that are trying to be more connected in men's groups or women's groups or whatever. So often those are those stay on the surface or they're doing a Bible study that rather than the Bible study really driving down and helping them go deeper, it's, it's something that they use to hide behind to gain more intellectual knowledge that they're not going to apply anyway. And, and so uh, it, it really is essential that we begin to develop in our relationships. And, and, and where I wanted to blame everybody for my spiritual condition growing up and for much of my 20s, looking at other people in the churches failing and yada, 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 and some of that, and certainly some of that was true, but I have to take responsibility for my spiritual well-being. So I'm going to go out. I'm going to look for guys that want to go deeper in their relationship with Jesus. I want to look for guys that are willing to be raw and honest about their sexual and, and emotional and relational struggles. And together, we're not just going to commiserate, but together we are going to utilize our time together to become better sons of God, husbands to our wives, uh, friends to one another. So we need a band of brothers that do, that knows everything about us and that we're – really vulnerable with, and sisters need a band of sisters, and it's so unusual and so rare, unfortunately, to find that 
that that's happening in the context of the church. That's a, a place we need to go back to and really work to develop um, those kind of relationships to fill in the gaps and the emotional hungers that we've used pornography and sexual sin as a counterfeit for. Yeah, and, and a verse that says that all, 2 Timothy 2.22. So it's easy to remember, 2.2.2.2. 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2.22. The twofold counsel, first, flee, flee the youthful passions, the passions of youth, and pursue righteousness, faith, and love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We come back in six minutes. I just want to address issues having to do with gender identity confusion with my guests, Gary and Melissa Ingram, Love and Truth Network. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Many of you know my own story and calling, although God called me in 2004 to begin to address issues having to do with LGBT activism. It had no intersection with my life previously. I don't come out of homosexuality. I never dealt with same-sex attraction. Never had a particular burden to focus on ministering to those in the LGBT community. It was the activism that got my attention in 2004, and then God began to break my heart for the people. So the word we have followed all these years now is reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. My guests, Gary and Melissa Ingram, who lead Love and Truth Network, are helping us, especially on the reach out part today, with their own powerful testimonies. To find out more about them, go to Love and Truth, spell A-N-D, Love and Truth Network dot com. Find out about them coming to minister at your church or helping individuals in need. All right, this is a massive subject, but we can only touch on it today. The rise of transgender awareness, not just from the Bruce Caitlin Jenners of the world, but now shows for years back with little children. I was on a show with Tyra Banks years back where they brought on little children, seven, eight years old. This is Johnny, who's now Jane, and people crying and parents hugging each other and all of this. We recognize that there are struggles very deep. We recognize there's some people who are biologically or chromosomally intersex. That's something different. We're talking now about those who are biologically chromosomally male or female, yet they're convinced that they're trapped in their own bodies, and they will say, no, no, their brains are different. There's something that's actually different about them, and this is becoming increasingly prevalent. What words of wisdom would you have, and you can each weigh in as you desire. We've got a limited time to explore a giant issue, but what can you say about the rise of this? What can you say about uh, how we address these issues as a church, just specifically in if you've got a mom and dad and a three-year-old boy who believes he's a girl? So first, why are we seeing such a rise in this? And second, any words of wisdom for a family struggling? Well, I think one of yeah, the Yeah, I would say, Dr. oh, honey, you go ahead. Nope, you go. Uh, it, is that one of the main things feeding into this, I believe, is the the longstanding issue of, of fatherlessness in our country. A, a lot of divorces mm-hmm. happening um, inside the church and outside the church, but a lot of dads that have left the family or abandoned it, as well as those who are present, but they are checked out um, into their own sexual addiction or some other thing or workaholism or whatever, and, and often thinking that kind of it's the mom's role to raise the kids and, and not realizing what a vital role a father plays in, in both the son and the daughter's sense of well-being and who they are mm. as image-bearing gender beings. And, uh, and so I, I think a lot of what we're seeing is the result of generation upon generation of that kind of absent uh, uh, condition of dad. And so part of the solution for that would be, a big part, would be fathers beginning to really get involved in, in their, both their sons' and their daughters' lives, to really be paying attention to what they're drawn to, to, to not shame their son or their daughter if they are showing signs of, of interest in, in other things, giving them space to be, uh, to be maybe, as a boy, artistic and creative without shaming that, but where they're seeing uh, tendencies toward gravitating to the other uh, gender or those kind of likes, I think dads just need to really come alongside and be good 
um, healthy boundaries and, and um, bumpers like in a bowling alley, and, and that the dad takes a real interest and takes time to be with them in that process through the long haul. Got it. Melissa, go ahead. Yes, and I, I would say in total agreement with that, that we want to be affirming our children from very young in the goodness of being born, of being created as a girl or a boy, according to their biological gender. And so, as you mentioned, there are rare times when someone is actually born intersex. But, um, again, that's the rare instance. Instead, I think we're seeing parents who um, really are leaving it up to the child to decide right, who they right. want to be. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I mean, most days my five-year-old is running around pretending to be a panda, a panda bear. And so, right, right. Um, I mean, that's okay to pretend, but, um, yeah, but at the end of the day, um, you know, he's a boy and I'm the parent and he needs to, you know, to be okay with that. And I don't mean to make light of a very serious situation. And I want to encourage Christians especially um, to not have quick and easy answers. I mean, whether that's to transgender struggles or even um, same-sex attraction, that it's so important to listen to the person's story, to listen to the family, and then to respond with compassion and truth. And, and to get educated. I mean, there's lots of good resources out there now from a Christian perspective on transgenderism. And we need more, but uh, at least there's more out there now. Yeah. But well, Dr. I... Brown, there's also the reality that, I mean, kids are wet men. And, and the things that oftentimes parents are allowing, parents are not even realizing oftentimes that the stuff that kids are watching that are supposed to be age appropriate, there's mm-hmm. trash that, 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 that we would never let our kids watch that are it's supposedly age appropriate but it's very confusing when it comes to gender, very confusing when it comes to uh, uh, even disrespecting male characters. And, and uh, there's a variety of things out there that we, we just don't even let our kids watch or engage in. And I think oftentimes even Christian parents are allowing their kids to have a steady diet of it, and they're not realizing they're forming an, uh, an identification with that character, maybe the other gender. And it's not an attraction like a healthy attraction. It's an identification of I want to be uh, this person, or I, I, I want to um, like the things that they like. And, and that begins to, when you, when you have that day after day, week after week, month after month, that begins to really solidify yeah. uh, and, and, and take on um, some important uh, uh, thought process in that child's mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and friends, we are, we are literally out of time, but this is why you need to consider having Gary and Melissa minister at your church, do equipping teaching, help with specific situations. The Website again, loveandtruthnetwork.com. You can find out more about Gary and Melissa, what they do, who they are, the ministry that they have. But I want everyone to have this takeaway. There is hope for new life, transformation, wholeness in Jesus for every human being. Listen, Gary and Melissa, keep up the great work. There's so much resistance for the good you do, but it's needed, and God's blessing is on you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Brown. All right. Have a good day. All right, you too. Hope you profited from that.